It's a, a truly a pleasure and an honor for me to be here with you and to partner with uh, BC Tech on uh, this great event today. Uh, I think, as you said, we have um, a great agenda to, to cover some really important topics. So um, I'm going to be uh, moderating a panel in a few minutes, but I wanted to kick us off with a, a couple of slides, uh, a few slides to frame the subject around uh, my view of what is Canada's innovation performance at the moment. Uh, Raphael, if you go to the next slide. This is a, a, a diagram from a report, an annual report from the World Intellectual Property Organization. Uh, those of you who may not be familiar with this, I encourage you to seek this report out and read it. It's a fascinating read every year. And they provide a, a really in-depth review of innovation performance uh, for uh, all the countries around the world across many different um, uh, categories. And you can see here that Canada ranks, you know, uh, 17th in the last report in 2020, which is, I would say, a mediocre result. Um, and it's been relatively stagnant over the last several years around that mark. Um, when you start looking at the, the uh, results from the report in a little bit more detail, you see that we actually rank pretty well in terms of innovation inputs. Um, so we rank ninth there. Uh, but we rank uh, much lower in uh, in terms of innovation outputs 22nd. So, you know, one of the first order um, conclusions from that is that we're not getting the results from the investments we're making in the country in terms of innovation and growth. Um, when you double click a little bit more, um, there's some really interesting conclusions that you can draw from, from the report. In terms of innovation input, we do really well in terms of our institutions and our market sophistication. We're kind of middle of the pack in terms of actual human capital, but we're really poor in terms of infrastructure, which they measure along all sorts of different factors. But you know, you can attribute to access and use of ICT infrastructure in the country. So, um, whereas we rank really well over. Overall, in terms of inputs, there's a lot of improvements that we can make in terms of our in infrastructure. Um, on the output side, um, again, relatively poor performance in terms of knowledge and, and tech outputs. And when you again, when you look further into the report, you see that that's really attributed to lack of adoption and use of advanced technologies, and which is going to be one of the subject of, of our panel later on. Next slide, please. We then also looked at a, a report, really interesting report from the Conference Board of Canada. And what they do is they rank Canada and all of the Canadian provinces against other jurisdictions, other countries around the world. And they grade that again around uh, all sorts of different um, elements of innovation. And you can see that the Canadian performance and the BC performance are relatively analogous, uh, despite some differences here and there. And, and what we see is that we, we lag in terms of capacity. We have relatively poor performance in terms of capacity in an in investment in our innovation engine. Um, we have excellent entrepreneurial ambition and activity. And in fact, there was another report a couple of years ago from Bloomberg that said that Canada was one of the leading countries around the world in terms of in terms of um, startups and not from not per capita, but actual um, numbers, uh, absolute number of start startups in the country. So we do really well in terms of entrepreneurial ambition, but all of the supporting elements um, in terms of the business elements required to enable the success of that entrepreneurial ambition really lag in the country. And that leads ultimately to poor results. Um, that report is a couple of years old and the latest uh, budget in BC, I think articulated some some interesting ambition in terms of innovation, including NBC and $500 million investment, I think is great. Um, so we'll see the, you know, the results of that in the coming years. But overall, I think there's, there's still improvements for us to make in terms of adoption of, of digital technologies in, in the country and in the province. Next slide, please. 
So SendGen, we're not for profit. We were founded uh, about seven, eight years ago with a, a pan-Canadian mission to help drive innovation and growth of the ICT sector in, in Canada. And we do that in a couple of different ways. Um, we, we work, uh, we offer uh, technical validation services for SMEs, for innovative SMEs to help them accelerate their growth to market. Um, so we have a, an advanced technology infrastructure that allows us to host these SMEs and do some advanced validation and, and technology testing projects. Um, one of the things that we've started to do recently is, is align these projects to vertical industry objectives. So for example, in mining, we've deployed um, an advanced um, wireless infrastructure in a mine in Ontario, which allows us to host mining SMEs to do project in a real environment. We're doing the same now in a greenhouse for, for precision agriculture use cases. So we're gonna do more of that in the future in terms of aligning our SME support programs to vertical transform, vertical uh, industries for digital transformation objectives. And the second pillar of, of, our, of our work is around talent. And I think it's a, it's a uniform uh, challenge across the country in terms of the qualified talent, both the business, but specifically technical skills to fuel the industry. And so we work with uh, post-secondary in, uh, institutions across the country around programs for uh, co-ops and internships, as well as continuing uh, education. Next slide, please. So the opportunity for Canada is, is uh, meaningful. Uh, this is a report, this, this stat comes from a, port, a report that we commissioned about a year and a half ago from IDC Canada around the state of next generation networks in the country and the opportunity for digital transformation of our vertical industries. And they found that the, there could be an opportunity of an increase of $330 billion to Canadian GDP through adoption of digital technologies by our, by our industries in the country. And that's something around 15 to 20% increase of GDP, which is a significant amount. Um, so that'll be the subject of, of a lot of what we talk about in our panel coming up, specifically around the mining industry, but this applies to every industry uh, that matters to the economic engine of the country. Uh, both in terms of the economic growth that it provides in the country, but also its global competitiveness of, of our industries. And I'll, we'll have a link later on. I think we'll make this uh, report available to, uh, to all the participants today. Okay, and last slide. Thank you. So what are the, ba the barriers to adoption of uh, advanced technology and for digital transformation? This is a report from a couple of years ago, which asked managers to, to rank you know, their top three um, barriers that they see. And you can group them in, in three general categories. One is lack of strategy and testing opportunities. Uh, lack of strategy is, is a big problem. The, the IDC report that I talked about just now um, reported that something like 60% of Canadian enterprise had either no digital transformation strategy or a poor one. Um, so without a strategy, it's, it's hard to, to set a path to success. And part of that is the opportunity for those enterprises to have an environment where they can ideate, where they can test um, in a safe sandbox some of these opportunities for, for digital transformation. Uh, the second obstacle, not surprisingly, is, is cost and uncertain ROI which I think goes hand in hand, frankly, with a lack of strategy. So without knowing where, where an enterprise is going, it's hard for, for them to see the return uh, of the opportunity that comes from that investment. And finally, the, the lack of skilled workers that are required to effectuate the strategy and the execution of that, both in terms of business um, skills, as well as the technology skills and all of the different elements of of the value chain and the technology chain for digital transformation. So we're gonna explore a lot of these topics in, uh, in the panel coming up. Um, I think the next slide is, is uh, just a link to, 
to the report that I referred to, the IDC report, and I believe we're going to make that available to, to all the participants, maybe in the chat. So with that, I would like to introduce the panel. If we are going to bring everybody up. So um, on the panel today, we have uh, three people who have a lot of knowledge and experience with uh, topics of innovation and adoption of innovative technologies. Uh, first, we have Eli Ardakani, who is the CEO of Meta Innovations Technologies, and I'm glad to say also a Sengen uh, Project alumni. We have Kalev Ruberg, who is CIO and VP Future at Tech. And we have Arash Nejad, who is Executive Director at Motion Metrics. So welcome, everybody. Good morning. Morning, guys. Everybody's off mute. Great. So Good to be here. Thank you, Jason. Let me start uh, with, with you, Khaled. Um, so you work for Tech, a global uh, leader, and I'd like to maybe start us off with you telling us a little about the innovation culture in your company and what you see as the strengths of that, but also perhaps some of the limitations of that. Well, it's a, it's a big question, and uh, tech is 100 years old, uh, and uh, uh, thank you, JC. Uh, I'd, I'd like to uh, start by, um, by first of all, uh, uh, being very grateful uh, to be on the panel and grateful to BC Tech uh, for all the work that it does in the, in the province uh, in, in terms of uh, promulgating all of the, the capabilities that we have in the province. Um, I think the innovation culture has been strong. Uh, we're a 100-year-old company. And while we think in BC Tech uh, mostly of digital innovation, uh, really tech has been inventing since the 1930s, 1920s, and inventing and innovating. So you know we began we began with flotation capabilities that were unknown in the industry at the time. Um, uh, actually, made it possible to uh, to begin to mine uh, elements such as copper in a in a very uh, uh, profitable way. Uh, then looking at magnetic surveys, which our, our previous chairman, Dr. Norman Keevil, actually uh, pioneered uh, and discovered uh, one of the largest zinc deposits on the planet uh, up in Alaska. Um, we're now moving into far more advanced technologies and the marriage of uh, technologies with physical and chemical uh, sort of capabilities like ore sorting at the shovel head, uh, ore sorting on the line with MindSense, which is a local uh, BC company, um, multi-purpose computing on trucks, and shovels. Uh, we we we, uh, uh, we use a, a, a very specialized military computer on the truck uh, called an octagon, and uh, it does uh, more than ten uh, uh, types of applications that run on the truck and supports them. Um, we have the uh, widest Wi-Fi coverage in mining and moving uh, uh, to LTE, but we have the the widest Wi-Fi coverage, in fact, uh, of all mining companies on the planet across the in all of our all of our sites, and it's all standardized. Um, we engage with uh, innovation programs at MIT and the Corporate Innovation Program, for example, and we have a very innovative uh, a, a sort of program at, at Tech itself called Ideas at Work, and it's a fund where we uh, we actually uh, triage what kinds of innovations we would like to actually try. Um, uh, for example, from uh, uh, from sequestration of CO2, um, uh, dust suppression using RF, uh, train loading. Uh, and uh, electrification opportunities uh, throughout the mines. And uh, this fund has been, uh, you know, uh, I think been quite successful in introducing uh, uh, innovations. And, and one of my big uh, problems uh, that I see is that we don't fail enough uh, and, uh, and that we don't actually try things that are right on the edge. We try things that are, you know, no, more known than not. Uh, so I, I think that that's one of the real issues. Um, but uh, the real, the really big innovations have really uh, started over the last two years with the Race 21 program, and Andrew Milner coming into the company. Uh, Race uh, really stands for Renew, Automate, Connect, and Empower. It really is directed towards digital improvement of our business and moving to a manufacturing model. So um, it 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 really has encompassed and embraced uh, all aspects of the business, everything from renewing the sensors. Um, autonomous driving or autonomous autonomously driven trucks 
through connection, in other words, a, a fully digital backbone of, for all the data that we make our decisions and, and also uh, establishing machine learning and AI techniques for analysis. Uh, so it, it's a very broad program and the, uh, the E in race is a really important one and that's the empowering of the people. Uh, to use these technologies and actually drive home the uh, the capabilities uh, that we uh, that we uh, find uh, at the sites. Uh, in order to deliver all of this, of course, we have to engage uh, not only uh, the the people that we hire, but also a very large number of people um, from the, the smaller companies and larger companies uh, that uh, that are here resident in BC, but also around the world in Chile. Uh, and in Peru and uh, you know in the US uh, and in Australia as well so it, it's a it's a very broad approach uh, to innovation uh, including um, uh, you know engaging with VCs and universities great thank you uh, anybody who might have thought that mining was a low-tech industry got that dispelled very quickly um, so you talked about um, not failing enough maybe not failing fast enough not being on the edge I think this is where some of the smaller um, innovative companies can, can come into the picture maybe. So Ellie, if you can talk to, you, to us a little bit about your experience um, as, a, as a startup engaging with you know, larger uh, leaders in the industry in terms of getting your uh, innovations and solutions adopted. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so it's, it's really great and awesome to hear that, you know, Cal was talking about all these innovation that is happening internally uh, within such a large organization. Um, for us, for Meta, we are a tech startup and we are focused on merging latest digital technologies into kind of ancient industries like oil and gas and mining. These are really, really big industries and digital transformation means a lot to them. However, they are slow um, in the pace of change. Um, so one of the things that, you know, as a small provider, we notice um, we have a lot of uptake from smaller, medium-sized companies and not a lot from the larger companies. And if you look at the technology adoption life cycle, um, most of the time, those large companies like corporations like Exxon and Shell and Chevron, they sit at the end of that life cycle. So they are technically majority um, uh, late adopters and the laggards. So it kind of makes it hard to approach them because they want to kind of bet on something that is really safe and it's not as new um, because there is not a lot of incentive in terms of culture, but also in terms of financial incentive. Um, to kind of bring in new technologies uh, that are fairly new. Um, one thing that I could say, talking to executives of those large organizations, it always comes across that there is a little bit of a difference between the pace that a small provider wants to provide um, their technology and a pace that a large organization can adopt that technology and introduce it to the company. And that time frame difference makes you know a small company survive and try or fail in terms of adoption. Um, so that is something that comes across um, when we are dealing with the larger organizations. Um, the hope is that as we are, especially after pandemic, um, and how digital technologies actually prove to be very valuable, we are hoping that you know the strategic decision makers. Um, can actually see the point much more than um, early on before 2020 um, to be able to kind of open up the horizon um, of their mindsets to, you know, small digital companies being able to provide them with the solutions that are flexible, um, that makes their life easier and actually drives value within the business. Great. Um, so Arash, maybe you can jump in on this one as well and, and talk to you a little bit about your experience. And um, maybe you can also highlight uh, a specific engagement that you've had that you maybe you, you had you know, yielded some success and and explain how that happened and, and what were the outcomes of that. Absolutely, thank you, JC, and grateful to be here. Thanks to the org all the organizers and everyone attending. I wish we had a better forum, and you know, in spite of COVID, we're in front of each other and talking human to human. But it is what it is. 
uh, and still grateful. So, you know, it, it's a great subject. And to be honest, I've been pondering on answering this question as to, you know, based on my two decades of experience uh, working across all heavy industries, um, I've been at Motion Metrics now five months, and it's been an incredible experience leading the team working with mining corporations. Um, you know, I, I look at the way large industries and enterprises work, and, you know, the statistics tell us 70% of their digitization efforts fall flat, producing no goals. That's billions of dollars lost. And to be honest, looking back at to what's, what's going on, um, I can't stop to think about what Peter Drucker would say, culture eats strategy for breakfast. Well, it turns out culture eats solutions, products, and almost just about anything else for breakfast. So you look at the mining corporations who've become extremely efficient at digging up um, and producing uh, minerals or precious metals and so on from the earth, trying to maneuver into areas such as um, cloud computing, AI, and sensing. And, and things don't seem to produce the same amount of results as a small company focused strictly on it. So at Motion Metrics, for example, we, are, uh, we have patented smart AI-enabled 3D cameras we you know, inject into operations. And then we mine that data. Um, and I'd say we've only scratched the surface, no pun intended. Um, and so in, in a case uh, recently, um, we are working with uh, actually a very large gold producer at a relatively small mine because they want to test it out. They want to make sure this thing works uh, in Latin America. In a, just a few little uh, tweaks that are operation through smart vision, uh, we're looking at $30 million in savings. Now, that gold company could probably, with the resources or technically with the resources and funding in place, could replicate that, but they could never do what we can achieve with them. And that's really the trick. And, and to your other question, JC, and you brought up a really good point, there is a seemingly a high cost to technology from, you know, if I were to sit on, on the mining side and look at the cost of adopting these new tech, the ROI seems too uncertain. So, you know, my response is we as small companies or even larger enterprises with the new tech, with the new technology, we need to know, we need to understand what the problems are and how to solve them, deliver an outcome produce results that could impact the bottom line or the top line of these mining corporations. Great. Um, I just want to double click on one thing you just said about um, having an opportunity to, to test it. Um, how have you find, found it from motion metrics perspective, um, the ability to, to introduce uh, in these innovative solutions to, to target customers um, how do you approach the, the, the demonstration elements of that to, to, prove, to prove out your solutions um, in a safe sandbox, as I was talking about earlier, um, without having to enter what is, you know, a, a mining operation is, is a very tightly regulated and, and operated environment. So how do you prove the value of your solution um, uh, to your target customer? It's a, that's a great question, JC. And, and with some enterprises, we've been operating for now well over 15 years in operation in hundreds of mines. The value is there, but to test it at a mining company that's never tested our technology is a challenge to your point. Um, they are uncertain about the technology. They're uncertain about introducing a new tech into their operations. And we approach it in different manners depending on honestly, the risk-taking level of the management executive, it is a risk for them to introduce uh, us into their operations. Um, I keep telling my team that we gotta be taking the risk and, and uh, show outcomes and deliveries to the mining corporations that haven't worked with us and say, we're willing to you know, uh, work with you to deliver the outcome and, and work on a solution rather than here's a cool new tech gear you need to buy and it's only a promise so it's it's turning the table around saying we're here to help you we can take on take on the risk and and sit along next to you until you get to where you want to be 
So I, I think from Ellie and, and Arash, we've heard like issues from the, from the startup's perspective of maybe culture, financial incentive uh, challenges, uh, time frame mismatches, which I guess Ellie translates to capital requirements for a startup to be able to last long enough for adoption, right? Uh, the technology skills required in a large company. So Caleb, from your perspective, um, what are, from the perspective of the large player, what is the challenge of, of engaging a small startup? Well, uh, you know, there, there are many, and, uh, and Ellie and Arash both, uh, I think, uh, uh, nailed it in, in many ways. Um, first of all, it's about belief. And, uh, and, you know, Arash, you made some comments about culture, and it's very much about culture. Um, the, the larger the company, and particularly in mining, um, uh, there's uh, um, this enormous uh, sense of uh, it's always been done this way. Uh, people tend to stay in mining for a long time. It becomes their culture. It becomes their tribe, if you will. Uh, and uh, tribal norms are very strong. Um, and um, uh, the if it ain't broke, don't fix it mentality pervades. Now, the, the issue here is that uh, in our society today, if you, if you haven't fixed it today, it's broken. Um, and uh, because technology moves so fast, to uh, Ellie's point, that uh, today you already have a better solution to what, you're, what you were doing yesterday. And, and so the, uh, you know, the issue is that how do we actually match those two time uh, scales together uh, with small innovators and, and uh, large companies that, that don't tend to move very quickly nor change their mindset very quickly. Um, and then uh, there's also a bit of a, a herd mentality in the industry. That is that, you know, if, if one uh, company does, does something, then there's a, a great deal, deal of desire to do it either better or catch up. Uh, and these are usually point solutions, right? Uh, and and uh, vice versa, if they're not doing it, then, well, it, you know, it can't, it can't be right. Uh, but very often it is, and going against Against the that uh, uh, the prevailing uh, the prevailing direction is often um, the the way to actually gain competitive advantage. Uh, so um, uh, and 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 there is a, prova a prova pervasive attitude of you don't want to be first, but you sort of do want to be first. <laughs> you want to be seen as being very successful at being first. And so there's a, it, it's a bit of a dichotomy here that, that, uh, that we all struggle with in terms of culture. And so how do you overcome it? Um, another part of the mining industry that, is, uh, that uh, really works against adopting innovation is the whole cyclical nature of it. Um, you know, you, it, it is feast or famine. Uh, and during feast times, uh, there is a great deal of, of a sort of investment. Um, it happens for about a three or four year period uh, where you're, you know, tremendous investment and then it's literally famine and you coast uh, and whatever you had invested in has got to last you through that famine. It's almost biblical. And so um, uh, the, I think that that's another uh, part that really dissuades, um, you know, larger companies from investing in smaller ones because they feel that, well, maybe they won't make it through the famine, right? because we, we no longer can actually support them in many ways. Um, that being said, though, there are a lot of strengths in terms of actually getting into that cycle. As, as Arash, you mentioned, I think Motion Metrics is one of the, you know, the leading, uh, one of our leading uh, uh, suppliers in, 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 in the industry. Um, and, and in that case, uh, you, know, you, you actually have built up a capability that is required by the industry, like you said. You've identified a particular need. Um, in my view, that those particular small needs and very distinct processes are being met by the smaller producers, and we have many, many examples of that. Um, what is missing in the industry is sort of looking at the whole uh, system as a manufacturing system. And that is the big problem. We don't actually approach mining as a manufacturing environment. And so we, we don't apply the disciplines of... Uh, uh, of planned versus unplanned manufacturing. We don't apply the disciplines of WIP. We don't apply lean disciplines. And as a result, we don't look at the systemic impact of these improvements as opposed to the point impact of improvements. And, and the point impact of improvements are typically fairly easy to apply uh, by small companies. If you want to get into the systemic one, that becomes really tough. So. Um, that that was great, Liz. Thank you. What can we explore? Um, 
uh, a couple of uh, more uh, detailed examples of use cases. So uh, Meta and Motion Metrics are both, you know, you both are advanced technology organizations. So um, you alluded, uh, Arash, to, to the types of technologies that are in, involved in, in digital transformation, you know, AI, cloud computing, the whole advanced networking infrastructure, et cetera. So I'd like to hear a little bit more about um, some of the use cases, how you've applied these technologies to a mining problem and the problem you're solving and what are some of the you know the results of that in terms of value to the mining um, client in terms of improvement to their operation whatever metric it is that you were measuring in in deploying that technology uh, Ellie you want to start? yeah absolutely um, so for meta we do have two products one is AI augmented analytics for um, induced seismicity uh, within mining and also micro seismic data for um, oil and gas. And we also have a training um, solution, which is simulation based training uh, for geosciences and subsurface engineering. Um, and I can I can bring up an example for the training side. So one of the things that mining um, industry really struggles with is the churn of their employees, because um, there is a lot of talent that comes in, especially when um, there is a feast uh, and there is a lot of money involved um, and they churn very quickly. If the work environment is harsh for them, they cannot take it, they will move on. And also if there are other opportunities or the industry is not doing as well, so they're not actually getting compensated as much as they would want to. Um, and when you think about the churn of employees, you think about training because you invest a lot of money, you train those people, um, they get to be the subject matter experts and then you lose them. And that's a really, really big trade uh, when it comes to, especially on the operation side. Um, so you want to make sure that, you know, the, the training components that goes with the human capital is always there, is always accessible. And no matter how many new employees you're onboarding every year, they can have access to the same training that the previous ones had without going through the hassle of finding an instructor to come in and teach them something. Um, so one of the things that we provide is we provide the training in a format that is self-paced and is accessible at any time, at anywhere that the workers are. It doesn't matter if they are in the office, if they are in the field, um, it really doesn't make a difference. And it's kind of like micro learning. So we don't actually sit in a class and drink from a hose and then go away and forget everything. So the retention of the, the learning material is much higher. And the mining companies, like in general, um, we had instances that um, they didn't even know there is such a solution there that is digital, that is so high tech and they can have access to it because they, there hasn't been anything out there for them previously. Um, and they just used to old processes. So one of the things that, you know, Caleb mentioned about um, not changing is not always winning. Um, and if you don't actually see the problem and you're not solving it, um, it's not because there is no problem, you just haven't figured it out. Um, so that is one of those um, use cases technically um, that we kind of try to sit down, talk to the people who are in charge and say, hey, here is what you can get out of this product um, in a long run and in a short term. But obviously the innovation or innovative product adoption always benefits in the long run versus a very short term. Um, one thing that I wanted to mention though, a lot of the things that are on the digital side, like software, especially if they have nothing to do with data, the, the entry point is very low cost and it's very cheap. Um, it's a subscription-based, usually, model that you can get in, you can try it out for a year, and if it doesn't work, you can move on. So a lot of the corporations are just realizing it, especially in the mining. And are, are you able to translate the, the value that you just articulated into a quantifiable um, value for your customer in terms of what that means in terms of uh, dollars saved from, from employee churn or, or something like that? Yeah, absolutely. So globally, um, actually in 2019, before the pandemic, 
$2.8 billion was uh, spent on training geoscientists and subsurface engineers in only mining and oil and gas. That's a lot of money. And that's a repetitive cost because you have to train as you churn. You have to train as they forget. Um, so when we actually had a use case, when we actually figured out that um, usually the budget for training of each employee is within 5% of their salary and an average salary is about 100K or 90K, we could save them tens of thousands of dollars per year for not doing the repetitive training and having access to the platform that provides them with training. Great, thank you. Um, Arash, do you have an, an example? Do you wanna walk us through? Absolutely. And Caleb, I love what you said. If it ain't broken, you got to fix it, right? It, it's, you know, the, you know, the times are changing. Times are changing fast. Sustainability, social license to operate, especially for mining companies, it, is something that if it hasn't hit us at the executive boards, it will soon with a massive force. And, and so I want to talk about an example where um, given our expertise and technology and access to data, we actually got funding from the Sustainable Development Technology Canada, SCDC, and partnered up with the mining company in the CIS region, so ex-Soviet states. Um, and we're working towards uh, saving 15% of their combination energy, the, the process in which they dig up and crush the rock so they can extract material from it. It's actually a copper mine. And it's been wonderful and, and, and really trying to work towards that goal it's not just about energy savings, it's about productivity gain, um, safety, and, and being able to, and all of this, produce more with less wastage and less um, carbon emissions. And it's, it's, it's been wonderful, really, to, to go down that journey. And I want to refer back to what I was saying earlier, that it is about a form of a partnership. It's not about, here's a product, um, you know, figure out what to do with it, or here's a solution, figure out what to do with it, and the, and the other way. You got to open up on the other side and say, I need a partner. This is not my expertise. My culture is about digging up and extracting materials. I need a partner in AI. I need a partner in cloud and so on and so forth. And so that's what we're uh, aiming towards. And I'm quite happy taking that journey with them. Thank you. I, I, guess, I guess with those uh, couple of examples, they just illustrate really the, the potential of digital transformation to be significant in terms of uh, um, all sorts of metrics of, of value, whether they're operational, financial, environmental, social, or whatever. And uh, I, you know, I think that's incumbent on, on all of us as an ecosystem to be able to articulate the, the potential value to increase adoption, right? Uh, I, we have only a couple minutes left, but I'd like to, to use it to, to talk about talent um, and the need for the need and maybe the challenge related to the need for talent um, there was a stat a couple of years ago that said like 60% of ICT workers in Canada work outside the ICT industry, i.e. they work in the vertical industries um, in companies like, like tech or they work in law, at Loblaws. Loblaws has 3,000 software developers, right? So from, um, from both the large and the small company perspective, what is the, the, the challenge related to the, the need for talent around the digital technologies that are enabling all of these uh, value props that we've just talked about. Who wants to start? Oh. Sure. Uh, um, I think with the RACE program, that uh, there was a sea change in terms of our hiring of uh, digital talent. I mean, we did have um, you know a fair bit of uh, work going on before. We had a, we had um, uh, a technology shop that was about uh, 300 uh, and, and, up, and upwards, uh, depending upon the times. Um, of, of in-house tech technologists uh, who supported uh, and developed systems for tech. Um, with RACE21, uh, that's actually uh, now sort of a, took a step change. We have more than 500 people involved in analysis, in uh, machine learning, uh, in putting out sensors, uh, in developing networks, you know, new networks across all of our, our, uh, our facilities and operations. Um, and this become one of the pillars of operation, frankly, at tech. So it is, uh, it is as crucial as, for example, those who operate uh, the mine in terms of shovels and haul trucks. Uh, it's as, as important as those who work in the process plants um, and, and use the technology to actually separate uh, the metals from, uh, from, the, uh, uh, from the ore. 
and um, and, um, and making sure that uh, that all actually runs together. One of the best examples I saw was, was in a steel plant in China. Uh, it was a mile long and it was a rolling steel plant and there, there was nobody on the floor. There was absolutely not a person on the floor, except there were four people who were fixing the network. <laughs> so so I mean, it, it's a sea change in sort of how we actually uh, manufacture. It is, uh, uh, and, I, and I think that with the uh, latest, uh, I think, cyber attacks on uh, uh, Colonial Pipeline, that just underscores that you actually, those businesses and, and those critical um, uh, producers don't actually even run without without the technology anymore. It's it's not a matter of, of well you know we'll, we'll we'll revert back to a manual system. There are no more manual systems, right? So it, it is a, a pillar of our society. It's a pillar of our industrial society, and more and more it's becoming a pillar of heavy industry, and uh, and getting people to work in it. Um, frankly, when we see that it is actually an important place to work and that their contributions are valued. Uh, on all levels, whether it's GHG reduction or whether it's production, uh, you know, I, I think that that actually draws people in. And frankly, uh, you know, we, we have been able to attract attract the people. Um, I think it's a, an environment that is uh, um, uh, interesting. Uh, it gives them opportunity to travel and and learn a, a very different kind of, of area. And, and like I and, and like I was drawn to it as well. It's a very primary industry. It's very visceral, right? You're actually producing metal. Right? And that, that's, that's pretty neat.